because I told Christian earlier this year he has the same thing, but they still sign him up for stuff during, during prime time. Yeah, so, so make sure you check it every day before you do that because sometimes the person in charge of that, I think they do that, and sometimes they don't do that. Those purposefully sign up for that. For advisory, Or something. I saw there's quite a few people with school business. I just don't know what it is. Oh. Yeah. No, it's real life. I was considering just going. Yeah. Hello. Naomi should be here at 3 1 2 3. guys um <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started here both of the handouts you guys picked up i apologize they're not stapled together 
only some of our copy machines can staple and I couldn't get to that um, yesterday. So both of these make up 72. So the next piece in limits is we're going to talk about one new way to deal with indeterminate form. So we talked about factoring day one. Well, not day one, but two classes ago, I talked about how to deal with indeterminate form with factoring. Last time I saw you, I talked about how to deal with indeterminate form with conjugates and trig identities. Today, we're going to talk about how to deal with indeterminate form on complex fractions and then get a little bit of practice reading a piecewise function. So similar to the last couple of classes, I'm trying to give you a manageable amount of content. Um, so just a little bit, which would be 72. And then ask you to practice a little bit of one of the things we've done past days. So I have one Khan Academy for you at the end of class and it is the conjugate type questions we did last time. So let's just take a little more practice because those are a little bit harder. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, so the first part of this is going to sound very familiar. Again, really that all that changes is the algebra, but the algebra is what typically makes these questions difficult. So. Just like the last two classes, you're going to plug in the process called direct substitution and you're going to hope that you come up with the real number because if that's the case, you can be done. If you plug in and you get some number other than zero over zero, this is not indeterminate form. This is undefined, which makes the limit not exist. Same first two questions we've done for like three days now. I'm just giving you a quick little reminder there. But if we try to do direct substitution down here, we get one third minus one third on top, two minus two on bottom. This is indeterminate form. And if we think about the three tools we've talked about to deal with indeterminate form, notice how none of those help. You can't factor, there's no trig identities, and there's no, nothing to do with conjugates. We don't have a square root or anything like that. So, the process of dealing with this is we are going to have to remember how to simplify this. This is called a complex fraction. When you have small fractions within a bigger fraction, that's called a complex fraction. And those are not unique to limits. In fact, there's probably 10 different math things that I could probably think of where you need to be able to simplify complex fractions. But the hard part of this is remembering that um, <coughs> and then the questions will finish at the end. So let's go ahead and start off with question four, actually working out how to simplify a complex fraction. You really should, do you guys remember simplifying these in algebra two at all? Okay, I'm seeing yeses and noes. If you did, you probably didn't practice it too much. But question four, if you plug this in, you get one seventh minus one seventh, which is zero over seven minus seven, which is zero. So this is indeterminate form. I would prefer to do factoring, it just doesn't help. Can't do trig identities because there's not any trig identities. And I can't do conjugates because it's not set up the correct way. So what we will have to do is make this complex fraction simplified and not be a complex fraction. So really, of course, these questions vary in difficulty. Some of them will take just a couple steps, like two, and some might take four or five steps. But really it's this first step that's the only part that's going to be unique. So make sure you're paying attention closely to this. What I would love to do is multiply this fraction by 7 because times 7 divided by 7 cancels out. But mathematically you can't multiply this by 7 without multiplying them all by 7. Essentially what we're doing there is we're multiplying the top and the bottom of this fraction by 7 and 7 divided by 7 is 1. So we're going to change the way it looks without changing in size. Likewise, I would love to get rid of this divided by x. So I'd like to multiply this by x. But if I'm going to multiply this by x, every term needs to be multiplied by x. It's all or none. So what that leaves us with is 1 times an x plus a 7 times a 1 over a 7, an x, and a 7 plus x. 
Now again, some of these questions still are going to take a few more steps, but they're at least things we've been practicing a bit. What you need to appreciate is I went from fractions within a fraction, multiplied everything by 7 and an x, and now I don't have fractions within a fraction. That's why that's an improvement. But just like the first three type of problems that we did, before direct substitution is going to work, you have to get something to cancel. Luckily, x plus 7 and 7 plus x are exactly the same thing. The order of addition doesn't matter. We say that addition is commutative. That's the math term for saying the order doesn't matter. And then you plug into what's left over. And if you're not left with 0 over 0, if you're not in indeterminate form, what you get should be your answer. So again, the real trick to this is just knowing to multiply everything by 7 to get rid of one denominator, and then multiplying everything by x to get rid of the other denominator. <coughs> so in question 5, what do you think is one thing, well first off, direct substitution, it is 0 over 0. We really need to check that. But what is one thing you think we should multiply all of these by? Okay, I agree. Multiplying by 3 does a great job of getting rid of this smaller fraction. But make sure you multiply everything by 3 when you do that. Okay, somebody else, what else do we need to multiply by? H plus 3. Good. H plus 3 uh, divided by H plus 3 cancels out. But if you want to multiply this one by H plus 3, they all need to be multiplied by H plus 3. Now, what tends to happen here, maybe more so for me because my handwriting is probably worse than yours, but if you're not real careful with making this look as neat as possible, you're going to lose some stuff. You need to be real careful with what you have left over. Since these two canceled, I'm left with the 3 times the h plus 2. I'm just going to change that to 3x, 3 x 3h plus 6. Over here, 2 times h plus 3. And then the denominator, nothing canceled. Now, I have one mistake there that I purposely put this time to see if you could catch that, because it's easy to overlook. Negative. Right. You've got to treat this not like a 2, but like a negative 2. This minus makes a difference. So this was negative 2 times h and negative 2 times 3. Make sure you're paying attention to that middle sign. Okay, to me, this is the more, most important step in this question, because if you can't simplify a complex fraction, then you can't, there's no point if you can finish the end of it. So is everybody okay how I'm going from this mess to this? Okay, again, the questions can vary in difficulty on how they have to finish, but you should know that eventually something has to cancel, and eventually you finish with direct substitution. I would go ahead and combine the h's and combine the 6 and the minus 6. Now we can see something cancels and as soon as something cancels, just like we've seen for two classes now, third class now, once something cancels, direct substitution should work out just fine. One night. Anything specific about that one? Okay, then on the next one, I would like you to try the first step. On number six, this is an indeterminate form. I've already checked that for us. I'm not asking you to finish the question, but I would like you to at least think about what needs to be multiplied <clears throat> so that the next step is just one big fraction instead of smaller fractions within a bigger fraction. And I'd like you to put that on your paper, please. You can make corrections if you need to, but commit yourself to an answer.
Okay, hopefully you tried to multiply everything by 4 to make that one go away. And tried to multiply everything by x squared to make that one go away. And when the dust settles... Oh, I'm sorry. It's frozen. When the dust settles here, you should have been left with a 3 times 4 minus a 3 times x squared over a 4, an x squared, and an x minus 2. Did y'all get that far? Good. Again, complex fractions, there's lots of times in mathematics where those come up. Even in calculus, we don't just deal with complex fractions with limits. So, you know, that can be one extra thing you have to study some nights, or it can be one thing that you feel comfortable with if you're taking calculus next year. Okay, um, somebody in first period today asked a very good question. So I want to finish this question with you. I didn't ask you or give you time to finish it. I just wanted you to get to that step. <clears throat> somebody asked a good question about, can't I just let these x squareds cancel? You need to be careful. You, cannot, you can cancel out factors, which are things that are being multiplied. Like this x squared is being multiplied by his neighbors here. He's a factor. You cannot cancel out terms, which are things being added or subtracted to something else. So, if I gave you a quick example here, <clears throat> the real answer to this question is supposed to be 10 ninths. But if you let yourself cancel out terms, you're going to think that the answer is 1. Not the same thing. You can't cancel out terms, only factors. So instead, what you would probably need to do is continue making the numerator look different, such as GCF. such as the difference of two squares. Factoring still comes into play. Even though these aren't factoring only questions, we can still factor to help us. And then we need to recall um, a little algebra trick that rarely comes up. but. Okay. How do, or should I try direct substitution yet? Probably not, because we haven't had anything cancel. Until you have something cancel, you can try it if you want to, it's just you're still going to be in zero over zero. I need something to cancel. So here's what I need you to notice. And again, this does not happen often, but it does happen sometimes. This factor and this factor are almost the same thing. But this one's a positive 2 and a negative x, and this is a positive x and a negative 2. So the algebra trick is you can factor out a negative out of either one of these. So you just pretend like they have a GCF of a negative 1. Factor it out. That switches both of those signs and allows that to cancel. So factor out a negative even if you don't see the negative. It switches both signs and then makes those line up perfectly. Now something is canceled. <clears throat> so now direct substitution should finish the question for us. Okay. Negative 12 over 16 which reduces to negative 3 fourths. The nice thing is about the end of these questions, even though even if it's hard for you to see to factor out the negative, you know something has to cancel. So at least you kind of know what you're aiming for and you're not just trucking along and um, have a mistake that you're not going to realize till later. Okay, let's look at one more of these for today. So once again, I would like you to please try the first step. The unique part of this, which is try to make this complex fraction not be a complex fraction. And then we can finish the rest together as notes.
So I hope that you try to multiply everything by nine. That got rid of one of the two smaller fractions. And I hope you multiplied everything by three plus x squared to get rid of the other smaller fraction. Again, that's not the end of the question, but it's the end of what you need to know new or remember, because really you should have seen this in Algebra 2, but I know y'all don't always get a lot of practice. In the end, you should have been left with a 9 times 1 minus a 1 times 3 plus x squared over a 9, an x, and a 3 plus x squared. So this is where we can finish from there. But that's what that complex fraction is equivalent to. Now once again, I know that there's, so now let's finish it together. There's this temptation to let these two cancel, but this is a term, it's being added or subtracted to something, so you can't ignore that. It would be great if we could just cancel those, it's just not quite that convenient. What we can do is we could FOIL this stuff out. So 3 plus x times 3 plus x would give me a 9, a 6x, and an x squared. And I distributed this negative. See, combining some like terms, the nines are going to go to zero anyway, and the rest of the numerator has an x in common. So we could do a GCF, and now the x can cancel out the x. Those are no longer terms, they're factors. It's x times something on the top and x times something on the bottom. Now they're factors. And since something has canceled, it's probably ready to be finished. Plug it into what's left, get negative 6 on top, and 9 times 9 on bottom. Let's see, divide by 3, divide by 3, I think it should come out to be that. So after we got it out of the complex fraction, again I foiled 3 plus x squared means 3 plus x times 3 plus x, so I multiplied that distributed the negative, combined like terms to make the 9 and minus 9 go to 0, factored an x out of these two because they had the GCF, and then I saw what to cancel out, then direct substitution. Left. Now this is the last one of these we have to practice today, so this would be your last chance if you don't understand the process, especially at first, the first step to ask. The other thing I'd like us to practice today, as far as new, is um, this is really kind of a review from day one, but on day one I gave you a bunch of graphs and you just got to look at the graphs. You got to think about what the limit was as it approached from the left, what the limit was as it approached from the right. If those numbers were the same, that was your answer. If those numbers were different, then we said the limit did not exist. <clears throat> this is the same thing except instead of being given a graph, we have to read this piecewise function. And again, this is something you were supposed to learn in Algebra 2, but I realize that you guys don't practice it enough. This is often something that um, calculus students always struggle with, but there's nothing special about it. It's just that a, a, a piecewise function tells you use this function when x is bigger than 4, but use that function if x is between 0 and 4. So it tells you which one to use. you got to think about which one to use based on this. So you don't need to write this down for every question, but please write it down for the first question because this is what your thought process should be. You should be thinking about from the left and from the right. And depending on what these two are, is going to depend on what your answer is. Now, if I'm approaching x, as x approaches 4 from the left, think about on a number line. From the left, your x value is slightly smaller than 4. Well, which one of these two is when x is less than 4? 
That's the top one. Remember, alligator eats the bigger side. That's how you guys usually learn inequalities. So if I want to know as x approaches 4 from the left, I'm thinking of x values less than 4 but close to 4. So I should plug 4 into this and get 2 to the 4th, which is 16. So the limit from the left is 16. But the limit from the right, so think on a number line. If you're coming from the right side of 4, you have to have a number slightly bigger than 4. So does that match this inequality or the bottom inequality? Bottom. bottom. This is when x is bigger than 4, which is what's going to happen when you come from the right. So now you've got to plug it into this, and you get 8 times 2, which is also 16. So again, you don't, you, you don't have to write all of this normally, but in your head, you have to think about what would it be from the left, what would it be from the right. If these are different and this doesn't specify, it's got to be both. Your answer would be does not exist, but since both of these are approaching 16, then 16 is your answer. It's 100% the same thing we did on day one, but instead of giving a graph that you look at and read, you're given a piecewise function to read. Okay, so we need to do the other two of these, and then there's a couple um, on the next page that I'd like to do with you as well. But. Okay, number nine wants to know what's the limit of this as x approaches pi? So, at least in my head, I know I'm thinking about what does it approach from the left and what does it approach from the right. Even if you're not physically writing that down, you have to be asking yourself those two questions. Which one of these should I plug it into if I want to know from the left? Top one, because that's when x is less than pi, which would be from the left. So I'm going to plug pi into this. Cosine at pi is negative 1. From the right, I need a number bigger than pi, which would be the bottom. This is saying when x is greater than pi. So I'm going to plug pi into this. What's the sine at pi radians? Okay. So if the question was left only, this would be your answer. If the question was right only, this would be your answer. But this one doesn't say, so that implies both. If it's approaching a different number on the left and the right, that limit doesn't exist. Okay, you take a moment and try question 10. Once you get the hang of these, that should have been about enough time to work it four times. From the left, I would want to plug it into the one where x is less than that value, negative 10. The right side, I would want to plug it into where x is slightly bigger than negative 2, which would be the bottom one, which is also negative 10. And if it approaches negative 10 on the left and negative 10 on the right, then that is your limit answer.
Now, to fully make it seem like they won, this is way too much work in my opinion, but you could technically graph y equals 5x and then just keep this part of the graph and then you could graph x cubed minus 2 and just keep this part of the graph and then if you looked at that graph you could do exactly like we did on day one. You could look from the left, look from the right, and see the y value that it's approaching on each side. But we're doing it algebraically because that is more convenient. <clears throat> okay, there's a couple more on the other page I need you to look at with me just because I know there's a couple of things that are not necessarily intuitive to everybody. So first off, there's three questions I did not print off great. So let's go ahead and fix those real quick. Question three is supposed to be as x approaches negative one from the left. I don't know if the left printed off correctly. Number four is supposed to be as x approaches three from the left. And number five is supposed to be as x approaches negative four from the right. Again, I, I do my best to try to make those print off well, but sometimes my copy sometimes looks okay, but then your copy is a copy of my copy, and then it kind of gets lost in translation. So update those three if you can't see those very well. And the ones I would like you to try, just common mistakes for people, would be number two, number three, Oh, I think that's okay. Try question two and three. Commit yourself to an answer, and then we'll go over it to see if you fell into those. Um, see if you fall into those traps. Okay, of these two, I think number three is a little more intuitive since it only cares about as x approaches one from the left, you have to read these two inequalities and put some thought into whether negative one should be plugged in here or here or both. It just depends on the question. It depends on the piecewise function. So since this was from the left, which one did you plug it into? The top, good. When x is less than negative one, that's what would be happening if you're coming from the left negative one. So you plug negative one into this. You can lead your answer e to the negative one, or you can change that to one over e, if you remember that exponent rule. You guys okay why you plug it into the top only and not the bottom? Okay. Number two is a little trickier. Well, it's not really trickier, but it's different and not always intuitive to students. I want to know what is <clears throat> the limit as x approaches negative 3, both. Not just from the left or not just from the right. So, should that be plugged in to the top or the bottom? Hmm? Okay, so if I want to know 
negative 3 from the left, I want a number slightly smaller than negative 3. Which one of these would exist when x is slightly smaller than negative 3? Okay, so for the left, I'm going to plug it in the top and get negative 6 plus 1, which would be negative 5. For the right limit, which one should I plug it into? Still the top. Negative, you want the numbers near negative 3. Negative 2 to 1 have nothing to do with negative 3. This is a complete distractor. It's trying to make sure that you're not just trying to automatically plug it into both because you do that sometimes. Negative 3 from the right would still be plugging it into this. And if you're plugging the same number into the same thing, you're going to get the same value. But only the top part of that piecewise function would be slightly to the left of negative 3 and slightly to the right of negative 3. The other part of the piecewise function had nowhere near negative 3 and was completely unuseful. So if you try to oversimplify these as a process of just do this and do this and do this and you get the answer, it's not going to work out for you. If it worked that way, I would present it to you that way. You actually have to think about what that piecewise function is saying to think about if it needs to go on the top only, the bottom only, or both. So, to be honest, uh, these questions should be pretty quick, just depending on how comfortable you are reading those. Again, I know you don't get much practice reading piecewise functions in Algebra 2, but at the end of the day, that is an algebra skill we need to have. So, to finish up class today, we still have almost an hour, but I need you to finish this first. Check with my answers on the website so that if you're missing something or misunderstanding something, you can ask and get it cleared up today. I would suggest you look over the handouts from last class, 69 and 70. Um, because your one Khan Academy is on indeterminate forms and conjugates, and we did that on handout 69 and 70 last class. So I'm only giving you one Khan Academy today instead of two like last time because those questions are a little bit longer. But you might also want to consider graphing those in your calculator to check to see if your answer looks right before you put it in Khan Academy so you don't have to start over. And then finally, um, if you've not put 70 into Google Classroom, that was from last class, then I need you to do that today before you leave as well. So. Again, you guys have 55 minutes to knock those things out. I will, of course, leave the agenda on the board so you remember the order of all of that. But as you get to any of that that you need help with, of course, just let me know and I will help you. But like I said when we first started this, make sure that you're doing the best you can each day. We're trying to make it very manageable, small chunks of new information. But if you don't stay caught up, and you fall behind a little bit each day, and by the time we get to the test, you're going to feel overwhelmed. So make sure you've got this down before you call it quits today, please. And as usual, I'll give you guys a little bit of time to go ahead and just start off. So you can see how it goes, and I'll come around and bug you for some questions to help out. Or you can bring it up to me if you have them sooner.
think I can remember. Uh, Yes, sir. Oh, I didn't come with that. 